Hey everybody, good afternoon. Thanks for joining us today for our session on defunct JDE data. The what, where, and how to clear it. So um, some of you might know me, some of you might not. My name is Mike Guerin. I'm a senior advisor here at ISP3 Solution Providers. Been in uh, JD Edwards for, I first touched it uh, 39 years ago, so over 30 years in JD Edwards. I've been doing data cleanup, um, master data management kind of things, uh, archiving data for about 21 years, and I've been with Team Kane and now ISP3 through our acquisition by uh, ISP3 for about 21 years as well. So, I'm going to cover off today. Um, so your JD Edwards data, why should you care and where is it? Um, what's your goal in getting started with it? What to do with the information that you've got in the tables? Can I walk through some real world samples of data analysis and what's spun out from them? And then let's look at things that I might be able to help. We'll stop for Q&A a couple of times during the course of the session. So uh, we do have on the right hand side, uh, the, uh, the questions panel, send it in by that or the chat and we'll stop a few times and respond to them. So. So why should you care about defunct JDE data? Thanks to our wonderful uh, imagery wizards here, we've got this person drowning underwater. If your life looks like this, you're basically you're not being very efficient or effective or creative. You're just you're uh, struggling to stay around. So data adds up, and we're talking transactional master data. So JD Edwards, as everybody knows, um, it's a transactional driven system. So um, that stuff's hanging around there forever, hardening up your data arteries, giving plaque in there, making it harder to pump things through unless you're doing something to clear it out. There's also, as you go along in the course of a business, there are adjustments that happen. So you might have closed branches or geographies, you might have sold off lines of business, done tweaks to areas on the product side, so dropped out of some products or dropped out of some, you know, if you're in property management, dropped out of some, uh, geographies or types of businesses gotten into others. So all of those give rise to master data that you probably don't need anymore. Larger processes running over larger tables, be that backups, um, sales order updates, manufacturing runs, it makes them inefficient, makes them run a lot longer. Too much data as well, and this is, you know, thinking about master tables, control tables, chart of accounts, um, address book for vendors and other things. It makes it difficult and confusing for users. We've also, and you know, I think you'll probably be astonished by some of the, the things that we've seen, but um, backup copies that are hanging around for no purpose whatsoever, um, Z files that are just grow totally out of control, like weeds in your backyard, work tables you forgot about, and other things. Basically, uh, hidden toys in the attic that just end up taking up time and money, particularly from, uh, you know, if you're posted on your data or anything like that. So. Where does the stuff like to hang out? The most common one, the thing you'd normally think of are things like your transaction tables, and you're dead right. So the 911 for GL, 42199 for history on the sales side, 3102 on the uh, the work order side, 4111 Cardex 618 for payroll transactions. They're kind of the obvious ones that reduce performance, increase the backup time, you know, data replication, disaster recovery issues. Time goes by as well. You've also got transactions sitting out there that you might want to keep the data for other things, but if you've got defunct companies, business units, inventory items, leases, address book records, um, that stuff's going to build up. Master tables, old data, dead data, things you don't need. This is the things related to some of the items from the previous screen where you changed the business, you sold off a line of business, you closed an area, you changed your mix of products that you're selling but you've never gone back into the master tables and going to clean up there you know, for probably obvious reasons. There's also several key balance tables in JD Edwards, 902 for GL, 41021 for inventory, 1202 for fixed assets that drive an awful lot of your reports and processes. And that's typically whether you run them in JD Edwards or whether you're using something like Hubble to drive your reports as well. The other thing, and this is just astonishing with some of the stuff, custom data in the uh, 55 to 59, so often left to grow unchecked um, because there's no easy way to deal with it. Even in the GL, the 911, JD Edwards at least delivers a purge and a summarize program, even if it's just the 911 and doesn't have any intelligence to check out to other things. There's nothing in your custom tables. 
another hidden cables, 4801 from 2019 0801 back up at 1210. Z cables like we talked about, the F4211 underscore mic that I made when I was doing some testing for uh, a program for the yeah, sales order update, you know, other general work cables. So when we're looking at it, we normally classify it in these five areas. And the reason for that is your approach will be different depending upon where the tables are and what you need to be looking at. Mentioned before about uh, some of the tables that we've seen, here's some examples what we call the Academy Award winners since we're in the kind of um, the award seasons right now. 9-11 with over a billion records and almost four terabytes of space. Cardex with over a billion records and over two terabytes of space. An address book master with 20 million records. 72 million account master records, 57 million assets, 155 million uh, item location records, 17 million vendors. So the size is one thing. Probably the bigger issue with this is just the number of records that are out there. The, the one at the bottom I like to point out often as well, the AR notification history detail. People forget about things like this. Um, you probably don't need all of those records, but that's a hidden table that grows incredibly large that people tend to forget about. There's a lot of examples like that. So um, don't know if anybody on here has records more than this. If you do, um, let me know. I'll probably send you a Starbucks gift card for letting me update my, uh, my world record list here. So if you're looking at dealing with defunct data, the first thing you want to think about is what's your goal? What are you trying to accomplish? Um, you're trying to just get rid of old data because you've got 10, 12, 15, 20, worst we've seen is 28 years worth of data, you know, remember the 90s, um, hanging out there and you want to clear it up. If you've got defunct data, like we talked about, you want to clear that stuff off. If you've divested, I've uh, been involved in a couple of good sized projects where this has happened, you know, companies being sold, that'll change what you're going to look at. I will say no matter what, so if you're looking at defunct data or divested data, one of the first things you'll want to do is clear up the old data to begin with because that'll help you out with the rest of it. So, but what are you looking to accomplish? What's your end game for the business? How are you trying to help them out? That's going to trigger the approach that you're going to use. If it's old data, your first and obvious criteria is date-based. Um, Within J.D. Edwards, if you want to be respectful of integrity, there's other things that you need to think about that we'll get into. If it's defunct data, well, what's the criteria? Are there business units you're trying to get rid of? Is it entire companies? Is it a line of a business that's represented from your product data records? Are there a bunch of very old leases that you don't need anymore? If you're a public sector, are there jobs and related records uh, for work that you've done for maintenance you don't need anymore? And how are you identify that? Is there something that's already out there that you could use? If you are divesting data, it's likely gonna be, from what we've seen, company, perfectly. Um, optionally, it could be at the business unit level, which makes it a bit more difficult, but still manageable, where you wanna get rid of the information. And business unit could also relate to jobs, so. So where do you start with this? Well, we'll get into some of the analytical things you need to be looking at, but mentioned uh, a minute or so ago, you can't really clear up your master tables until you know where your master table records are used, and you can't really clear your master control tables until you know how you're using them. So no matter what, the first thing you need to do is clear up your transactional stuff and figure out where, if you're doing some defunct data from a master side, where are your accounts used, where are your items used, where are your assets used. Once you've determined which ones, you can start to clear out the transactions, and then you can start to clear out the master tables. But you gotta have your plan first. So, the starting point, um, J.D. Edwards talks about alert, um, analyze, and act. Um, it's kind of the same thing when you're looking at this. So analyzing is the first one. Um, and then you want to figure out what your actions are gonna be and then you actually want to act on it. So analyzing data is the first thing. Once you've analyzed, once you've taken a look at your tables, once you've figured out what it is that you wanna remove, figured out what the reach is, 
then you can start the removal process. You start from the outside in. So get your transactions, then master, and then control tables. Um, your transactions should always be first. Typically, you can look at a separate process for what we consider to be transitory tables. So these are predominantly Z tables, work tables, and EDI tables. And that's kind of across the board. And even if you've got custom tables, you will have some likely that fall into the same kind of category. So if you've got external processes, you likely have the equivalent of EDI tables to feed in and out. You will want to do a separate review for your custom tables just because you need to identify where the relationships are between them and what else you've got in JD Edwards. And going through this, um, my best friend, whenever I'm working projects like this, uh, aside from the, the main business analyst or the person that knows their tables, is the person that knows SQL. To be able to do record counts, do comparisons, so we know what we need to expect. We can reach out and see what's in the different tables and figure out how we want to approach things. When you're looking at transactional information, we normally look at this and think in terms of, so you've got um, what you think of as your legal retention date and then the data that's in there. That typically right now is sitting all in production. And if you've never done any kind of a removal of the data, you've also got sitting out there as well stuff that is, could be deleted but hasn't been yet. So you're starting off with a cutoff date here. So anything before that cutoff date, you know, current plus four, current plus six, current plus two, is what you should be able to move into your archive. And anything older than that, you should be able to just get rid of. One of the key things to keep in mind, and this is more from a user's perspective, is the data doesn't have to be in production to be available or reported on. So from the perspective of cleaning out information, you can look at it and say, right, I've got my operational data, and then I've got my data that I need to have for legal purposes, but I can have that in archive and I can have that in production. So the main thrust here is you want to be able to remove as much information as you can out of production, move as much as you can to archive and clear out what you don't need. When your transaction tables are cleared, if that's all you're looking at doing, great. If you want to move on and do actual defunct data from master and control tables, you want to do this first so that you have, if you've got old items, odds are if you're going back more than five years and clearing stuff out, you're going to get rid of the transactions related to them, which you need to do before you can get rid of the items. Same thing applies for vendors, address book, leases, chart of accounts, and business units. So the big thing there about it can be in both places at the same time. You can have information in archive, you can have information in production, and if you've got a tool like Hubble or even within J.D. Edwards, there are ways to let users be able to view the information between both of them without clogging up production. So what do you want to do with it? You want to archive the data out of your transaction tables based on your retention policy. You do need to think about the fundamental relationship between tables and J.D. Edwards, and this is where you can get into trouble if you're just using very uh, scalpel-like processes like are available within J.D. Edwards. You could have work orders that are tied to a purchase order, which is tied to a sales order for fulfillment, all of which give rise to inventory transactions. Sales and receivables give, or sales and purchasing give rise to vouchers and checks on the AP side and invoices and payments on the A or side. And of course, everything ends up in the GL. If you're going to start clearing stuff up, you want to try and maintain, you want to maintain that integrity relationship so that you're not breaking stuff. You often have to look at the dates and sometimes there are many. There could be a status update. There could be a GL date. There could be a transaction date and the statuses of them as well. Um, transactions where you've got information that is going to support your balance tables, like the 911 to the 902, 4111 to the 41021, 911 actually to the 1202 as well. You need to make sure that you're maintaining the sync between them. J.D. Edwards is generally a transactional-based system. Receivables and payables are a bit different. Posting for them is done on a batch basis. So depending on how you're doing other intercompanies and other stuff, you might need to look at this a little bit more carefully. Generally speaking, you want to start from the outside of the data universe for clearing out transactions, 
and moving inwards, much like we're talking about in the relationships in uh, point number two there. So speaking of things by defunct data, and if you're wanting to go through and clean things up, pardon me, a little slurp of coffee there. We've done, a, as part of the analysis that we've, we've done to work with companies on clearing out um, defunct data from a master side and transactional, we've actually gone through and identified what we think of as main aliases and, and where they kind of hang out at J.D. Edwards. So you look at something like the, uh, the second item here for business units, they actually, there are, you think of an MCU, there's actually 90 different aliases. So there's MCU, there's HMCU, there's MMCU, you know, things like that. There are 90 different occurrences or different specific ones, and they're found in 1,574 tables in J.D. Edwards. Company number, there's 54 different CO, KCO, COO, KCOO in 1,628 different tables. Inventory, there's only six, but they're in 790 tables. So the main point here is when you're looking to clear things out, you're saying, right, I want to clear out something that's address book related. It's not just A&H &A you need to be looking at in the tables. It's variations of that as well, wherever they're found. So this is normally why you know, people try not to get into this. But as pointed out at the bottom, um, come to this in a little bit. There's ways that you can winnow this down and make it a little less scary. So. Master tables, what do you do with it? Well, when you've done your data analysis, which are the ones that need attention? Which are the ones that have XF data? From the knowledge of the business, which ones hold the obsolete data? So are there businesses, business units, companies for facilities, from things that are sold off, lines of businesses closed? Um, you know you've never gone into address book and cleaned it up and it's been a very long time. Are the users squawking about anything? You got millions of rows in your chart of accounts. You got way too many vendors. You got any reports that are running a long time? You know, look at your job queue. Look at um, how long things take. See if that can identify what's starting to interfere with your backups. How will you identify this then? If you're looking at something like address book, is there a criteria? Is there a category code? Is there a way to classify it? If not, is there a way to do the analysis so that you can use a code? that you're not using for something else to peg them. You're looking at things like the account master, business unit companies. More often than not, it's a company or a business unit or a range, so that can help simplify it. If not, same sort of thing, look at tagging them. Item master, item branch, again, it's often branch plant or product line, i.e. cat code based. You also, as you're going through and looking at this, there's invariably there are main tables, but there are tables that capture additional information related to the main one that you also need to look at. So we're looking at items, item cost components, bill of materials, and the item cost itself. Look at things like fixed assets and equipment, preventive maintenance schedules. So look at the main one, the UFO 101, but look at the ones that are related to that as well. So master tables, you can kind of see on the left-hand side, you're looking at building up some relationships there. To, to kind of figure that out. So you're branching out from the main down to the related. JD Edwards has tools that will help with this too, obviously. So as mentioned on the previous page, there's a lot more instances of these key fields than you'd normally think about. Um, 1201, for example, the asset number has links directly to over 20 other tables. And again, this is where going in with SQL can really help you out. So identify which fields you're using and identify which tables they're in and how many occurrences you have and start classify them. So if you identify the tables that you use, you can identify the criteria that you want to be able to use or help it to identify the criteria, then you can determine the groupings for what you want to remove, and then you can construct your removal process. You want to start from the outside with your master tables as well, so the transactional data removed first, then you can make sure that you're not going to remove anything that already exist or still exist in them. Um, move on to the control tables from there. The larger or main ones do first. You know, this is definitely where the 80-20 rule applies. If you're looking to clear things out, your biggest bang will come from a handful of tables. 
we normally see from a transactional side and a main process side, the top 10 or 15% of the tables have north of 80 or 90% of the data. So um, data analysis can help you determine, you know, if you're looking at 274 tables for business units, which ones do you have that actually have records? That can help it out. Um, do integrity reports before and after, obviously. And uh, probably a pretty obvious thing as well. You're gonna do this in a PY, like a, a test or a dev environment first. Um, test it out, make sure it works, run the reports, and then move on to production. So balance tables, there's really only three primary ones for most customers. So the trick with them is making sure that you, as you remove the related records that build up the balances, that you're donating to a replacement record so that things stay in sync. We also, if you're gonna take the time to go in and look at this, also say, um, look at other things where you might be keeping balances and determine whether you want to, as you're clearing it out, kind of summarize up. In the inventory side, that could be if you're tracking at the lot level, if you're getting rid of the transactions because these are old lots, do you want to keep balances by lot still, or do you want to summarize up just the location? Same thing with the 911 to the 902. If you're tracking stuff at the sub-ledger, and this is transactions where you're getting rid of it, do you want to, for those ones, summarize up and get rid of the sub-ledger and just do classic you know, cost center object subsidiary? Um, so that's the point at the bottom for summarizing out across the board selectively summarizing up for things like the subledger. Um, same thing for the other balance tables. From a special side for balances as well, you can, and this is more if you're doing line of business type removals, um, surgically removing things like the actual 902 records or like the 41021 or the 1202s. Make sure you remove your related transactions first, validate that you don't have anything remaining there, then you can get rid of the balance records themselves. And obviously you want to do SQLs integrities before and after to make sure that you're not leaving anything out there. The trick with the 902 in particular is intercompany transactions. So uh, you're normally pretty safe because JD which takes care of that, but you want to be careful. So hidden tables, uh, let me jump to the punchline at the bottom first. So things like Z tables, manual backups and EDI tables. So we've done analysis for over 325 customers. Um, across them, we've seen over 9 billion tables, records for Z tables, 13 billion in manual backups, pointless tables, and 5 billion in EDI. So um, a lot of these, like the manual backups, you can just get rid of. You know, there's no point in having them there. Other ones, Z tables, um, there's ways to get rid of it. You can use some JD Edwards stuff as well. Same thing for EDI tables. Uh, you also, when you do an analysis and you're looking at in terms of records and space usage, you're gonna find some surprising ones. One of the things that we find all the time is business function usage. We've some, seen some enormous tables for something like that. So the 98, 9, 12. Custom tables, 55 to 59. Um, these you can typically, so if you've got an F55 4211 for sales order details tied to the 4211, uh, you can establish the relationship there, and the tool that you're using to clear out the 4211 can or should be able to reach into the 55, 4211, clear that out at the same time. What you really need to do with this, and why it was mentioned as a bit of special analysis earlier on, is what's the relationship between your custom tables and what you consider to be the driver of the master tables? Is it tied to 911? Is it tied to 4211? Is it tied to um, lease master, lease transactions is tied to equipment. What's your driver for it? What's your link between the custom tables and the standard JDOs tables? If it's a self-designed full-on module, joint venture billing, for example, um, you should be able to put together the specs for how the tables relate and how you're going to be able to clear that out. Then it's just a matter of finding a way to be able to get to it. Work on the size and scale first. You might need multiple passes, but that's going to be okay. You know, if the numbers on the previous slide look kind of big, uh, 53 billion records we've seen in custom tables, including over 60 with more than 100 million, over three with over a billion records, just in custom tables. So 
when we look at approaching things, because we do a fair amount of this, you know, this is an example of looking at fixed assets and wanting to get in and clear things out. So we've identified, we can see on here, we've identified um, the related main table. We've identified the, the main key that we can use. You know, if we've got an efficient key that we can use for it. We've identified the table itself. And what we've done is, this is after the fact, but when we've gone through all of the tables, we want to clear up. We've then assigned them to a grouping, what we call a schedule, that we can keep together and process at pretty much the same time. <coughs> so clear out the fixed assets, then clear out the 1204, 1207, 1210, the related tables down the line to it. So. You'd also want to, when you're doing things like this, say, well, what do I expect to clear out? So what did my SQL say I should be clearing out based upon my criteria? When I run the processes, what are they actually clearing? So um, the worksheets that we have to work with when we're working with Purgit on these things for customers, identify all the main items as well, the main master that we've talked about, and where they're used, so which tables would be relevant for you. So general ideas. Mention the SQL analysis of summaries first. So when you're going in and looking at it, if, if your main concern is I want to clear out, I'm drowning in transactions, um, do a summary table by year and company for something like the 911, by year and branch plant and dog types for things like uh, inventory. So what's the criteria and how can you get to that by year in particular? and then by another criteria that'll make sense for you. Master tables, what are you looking to clear out? If it's your item information, what's the criteria? Is it a branch plan? Is it a category code? If it's the account master, is it a company? Is it a business unit? If it's a lease master, is it a line of business? Is it a category code there? So cross-check where your records are used in your tables if you're going to be removing the master data. So what's my usage pattern like for um, items from the 4101 to my transactions? What criteria can you use? Is there an existing UDC? Or do you want to do something else? When you're working with larger tables, just from a technical side, you want to use an existing index that's there. So you know, if you're going against MCU, is MCU actually in the first or position, first or second position of an existing index. If not, if it's a larger table, and my normal rule of thumb depends on the system you're running, but if you're running DB2, if you've got more than probably five million records in a table, and you're gonna be going against something that's not an index, create an index for it. So identify that information. It's just, it's gonna make it more efficient. There are some things that you can do as well, where if, for example, you're doing defunct data cleanup, and it's based upon MCU or business units, if you've got um, 11,000 business units and 4,000 of them are going away, rather than build up the logic and everything that you're going to do to determine for every table, you know, do this range, this range, this range, if you take your business units, you take the ones that you know you're going to be getting rid of and you move them to something like the 0006 in REM removal DTA, then any of your SQLs and any of your processes can just say, hey, check in this table, in this REM data. Uh, if I've got the business unit there, it's one I want to get rid of. So it's a simpler way to approach it. As I mentioned as well, we've got a pretty comprehensive Excel document built up over time that looks at accounts, fixed asset numbers, business units, company, item, and address book records, where they are, the related aliases, that we can tie to a table analysis that um, we can do for you as well. That's what we use with the purge product when we're working with customers. So data knowledge in the real world. So this is actual starting and ending for working with a couple of customers. That an item master we needed to clean up, largely based on branch plants for some divisions that were sold. So the starting point, there's 790 tables that have item information in it in some way, shape, or form. When we did the data analysis, we narrowed that down to 108 that the customer actually had that actually had data in it. We refined then down from them and said, let's look at anything with over 100 records, because that's going to be something of a significance. 
that got that down to 90. And then we said, let's factor out Z tables, work tables, EDI tables, because there's ways that we can take care of that with JAD Edwards tools, so we don't have to come in here with a separate solution. That got it down from to 63. So from 790 possible tables, which would make you want to run screaming to the bar, down to 63. That's a lot better. Same thing for business units or branch plants. Starting point, there's 1,574 tables that make use of MCU-related items. Data analysis got that down to a little over 12%, 195. Refining down again to items of significance, 160. Narrowing out the Z tables, work tables, and EDI, 108. Because this focus was from a logistics perspective, line of business for branch plants, we could then narrow it down to 58. So it started out as 1,578. We're down to about 3% of that, 3.5%. So the main point here is if you do a bit of due diligence up front, you can get a handle on it, um, and it becomes eminently more manageable. So I've talked a lot about data analysis and all that. You can certainly do, you know, you can do up a data analysis yourself. We've been doing this for a long time. So we look at um, the J.D. Edwards and the related tables, the records, the size, the module, the type. Because J.D. Edwards is batch and data driven, the performance that you're getting is going to be driven by the size of these tables. So it also identifies clutter when we're talking about things like backups that are pointless, um, excessive data in certain ones, Z tables that haven't been cleaned out for a while. Uh, if you're hosted or in the cloud, you're actually paying for every bit of storage. So what are you using yours for? Is it all needed? If you're planning on migrating to the cloud, well, maybe you clean things up beforehand, that will help out. Uh, if you're upgrading, I mean, this is motherhood apple pie. Um, there's more data to clear, to chew through. And also, if you haven't cleaned things up for a while, master, transactional, whatever, uh, you've got stuff that's out there Oh, yeah, we forgot there's that period where we didn't really do any proper receiving its purchase order. So clear the stuff out first. Um, if you're running four and a half terabytes in production and you are creating PY and DVN training and other ones, uh, unless you've got a way to skinny it down, uh, that's the gift that keeps on giving because each time you replicate, you're setting up the same thing again. And again, the last bit is your business changed over the years. Do you have master and other data that you no longer need? Just before we carry on here, we're just over halfway through here, I think. Alana, do we have any uh, any questions that have come in to this point in time? Thanks, Mike. Yeah, we do have uh, some that have come in. And just a reminder to attendees that if you have any additional questions, send them in via the GoToWebinar panel. Um, so just going back to that, um, slide you showed Mike with the examples um, this person said we saw in the example a lot of data to contend with especially that that four terabyte one so in your experience mm. what has kept customers from cleaning things out ah that's a great one um, when I ask that questions of people you know most often if it's the transactional stuff it's just you've never gotten around to it and you know the perspective, perspective is data is kind of cheap, but it it comes back to bite you at some point. Um, so just not thinking about it. Um, when we're looking at things like custom tables and some of the other stuff, honestly, it's because there's there's nothing out there that they're aware of that can take care of that simply and easily. So it, when you've created some stuff from scratch yourself, you're the only one that's got it. So clearing out your custom tables, um, there's nothing out there out of the box that's going to help you. Out. So that's one of the biggest things. The other thing is just time. Um, people just don't have the time for it, which is understandable. But at some point, um, I, I, I think one of our customers kind of summed it up best. He said, it's, it's not a matter of if it's going to come and bite you if you don't clean up. It's a matter of when. Mm -hmm. So uh, time, resources. Um, lack of knowledge of ways to be able to go about and do it, and just fear that they're going to screw something up by trying to go in and do it with something like SQL. I'd say the biggest reasons. 
Okay, awesome, thank you. And then, um, so we asked in our registration um, if uh, you've archived your data before. So this person said, we've never archived our data before and we're feeling a little bit overwhelmed. So uh, are there any initial steps that we can take to approach the project or a possible project? Uh yeah, I mean, honestly, I'm, I'm, you know, maybe I sound a bit self-serving on this, but we're on the data analysis slide. A data analysis is a great way to start. It's just, it allows you to see what you've got. You, you, you can't figure out where the winds are. You can't figure out an approach unless you know what you're dealing with for yourself. So the data analysis is a great way to do that. That'll let you see where your opportunities are, where your winds can likely be. And from that, you can determine what's the best approach. Um, when you get to the best approach, it's thinking about um, how far back do we want to go? So have a retention policy in place or figure one out. Um, are there criteria that you want to enforce for it? So if you're a sales or if you're a farm organization, you probably want to keep more information in your sales records and inventory for track and trace, but maybe less in other areas. Um, for other organizations, you might want to just clean up an awful lot. So it's a different by module or functional area. Um, and then for starting up the project, it's um, what do we want to accomplish? What are we looking to clear out? What resource constraints do we have? What's our data analysis say we want to do? And then how are we going to approach it? And how the approach is going to be? Um, you're going to try and do something in house, you're going to try and use a tool. That would be my, my quick level. But the starting point is the analysis. Know what you're dealing with first. So okay. hope that makes sense. Yeah, I think so. And if there's any clarification needed, please just send my way. So I think we're we're good actually then to carry on, uh, Mike, with the data analysis. Cool. Thank you, ma'am. So yeah, I mentioned before, we've done the, a bunch of these before. We basically we say, hey, here's a quick script. We've I had clients turn it back in like 10 minutes. So the there's no confidential information so we're looking at by module and type of table um, we take the details and we've got this a uh, pretty sophisticated uh excel based analyzer that runs on top of it then so record counts and size by module type of table so we can say for example you've got these manual backup tables uh, that you can just get rid of um, here's some old work tables here's your z tables what transactional data from core modules can we take care of out of the box with the tool we use, which is Purge It? And what do your custom data look like? You know, are there groupings in it? Do you have um, a bolt on that you can identify the system code? And we can group that information as well. If you want, we can also extend it, you know, not across everything, but the main transactional tables on a temporal analysis that lets us say for your GL, for your inventory, as examples, you've got 23 years worth of data. And here's the split by year in those tables. If you're looking at wanting to be able to do something like the master tables, so you know company business unit account, fixed assets, etc., uh, we have extended worksheets that we can use tied to the data analysis that can help with that as well. So it's a quick process. Uh, we give the details that says exactly how to get the information. We run it through. Um, if you want to say we want to get rid of, we want to do a cleanup on address book or this or that, let us know. We'll dive a bit more in that. Uh, we present the stuff back to you and say, this is what it looks like. If you wanted to use our tool, here's what can help you out. Here's some quick wins for you. And then just discuss it. What's the plan look like? What do you want to accomplish? Um, how can we help you? How can you help yourself? So, we mentioned, or I've mentioned a couple of times about Purge. So that's the solution we work with. It's purpose built for JD Edwards. So when we're looking at main transactional information in JD Edwards, we have eight main modules, and the numbers in black represent the transactional tables that we clear out of the box. Some are pretty simple inventory, there's only one. There's up to 23 in sales orders, it's up to 41 in payroll HR. The tail end there is the custom. Custom lets you get to anything, and I mean literally anything so when we're doing divestitures of companies that's what we're using if we want 
you clear out things for a module that we don't have, like transportation, like um, lease accounting, like property management, we can use the custom module. And for a lot of the ones like that, we already have, we don't have a full module, but we have some starter schedules already built. So the main point here is for the core stuff that you're going to want to deal with in J.D. Edwards, for these eight main modules, we got you covered. We mentioned uh, the data analysis, so I wanted to just give some examples from a couple of customers, um, you know, obviously anonymous, but that we've worked through. So this one, 225 million records, 357 gig. Not huge, but you know, kind of representative. Two-thirds of the records, 72% of the data size, eligible for standard transaction removal. So when I say eligible, I mean they're within the eight modules that we talked about. They're in the standard transactional tables. So two-thirds of their data we can access. They had 54 million 902 balance records and only 101 million 911 records. That's an incredibly high ratio. Um, and 85, you see the master balance information there, 61 million records, 83 gig. 85% um, of that was just these two tables. So a lot of stuff in the sub-ledgers. So when I mentioned before about migrating up or merging up uh, the sub-ledger for older stuff, great opportunity for that. Do you have additional ledger types that are out there where historically you do not need the information anymore? Only 200,000 901 records. That's not too bad from what we've seen. Yeah, it's pretty low compared to the number of 902 records. Five million records in the air stats history. When you look at the number of records they have in the whole system, that's a fair bit. 700,000 in notifications, um, just under 700,000 in the main AR transactions. So a lot of historical stuff on the AR side that can be complicating things for their AR staff just because it's never been cleared out. So next one, just under a billion records, under 1.6, just over 1.6 terabytes. This is the one of the ones where uh, you know the manual backups, 30% of the space and 30% of the records were just the manual backups. You don't need any kind of a tool to do that. You need to be able to know which tables they are and just get rid of them. So big, quick win from the analysis. Second largest, not uncommon, custom module tables. So 60% was custom module and manual backups. So stuff that they were scared of <coughs> and manual backups. You throw in the normal modules, 24% of the size, North of 80% of the data that they had can be cleared up. Master tables are actually pretty clean, all in all. And uh, 10 of the top 25 tables in terms of size were custom ones. So again, just highlighting again that the stuff can really, I wouldn't say run away on you, but really uh, build up over time and uh, catch you by surprise. And unfortunately, it's not too unusual. So, number three, pretty good example of normal JGibs transactions. So, um, about a terabyte, just over 800 million records, less than 9% of the tables account for 50% of the size because JGibs is transactional. So, 400 million 902 records, only 50,000 account masters. Definitely an opportunity to look at the 902 see how it's used and see what the opportunity is. None of you drives an awful lot. So again, just relating the tables and the records in them and what it's showing helps to point the direction of the analysis. The 902 was 40% of their total space. Adding it into the 911, 70% of their total space. So there were some other areas like messaging file, 1131, X related, you know, 1131, that could be cleaned up, normal J.D. Edwards routines. Um, 20 million records in archive tables that J.D. Edwards creates, like production cost archive, the 3102S. So you still need that. What this highlighted as well was a need to go back, look at some of the, the master data, look at the master to balance table, figure out what's going on and figure out a better way. And the, the, the other comment on this is, if you've been on the system for a long time, you started out based upon whoever your consultant was, whoever your business users were, 
saying how to approach it, and you've been running like that. Things change. Maybe the subledger approach in a certain area doesn't make sense anymore. So the last one was a big one. This is a service industry customer with payroll. So hence the one and a half terabytes of payroll data and over two billion records. Having said that, Kiel, you know, 30% of the total just for the 911 and the 902, 100, 100 million records. 40 million account masters. So some definite master table cleanup there and some historical too. Seven of their largest, 15 largest were custom ones. 86% of um, 856 million records in them were the top 20 tables. So part of this is just saying when you do the analysis, when you dive into it, when you start to slice and dice it, the opportunities for cleanup become clear pretty quickly. The other thing to point out here is when you normally, when you look at space, you normally think of, okay, the amount of space it's taking up the actual data. Um, doesn't matter what database you're using, you're also using index tables, and index tables can often take up as much or more as the actual physical space. So we can see here the GL, the file size is 360 gig. The indexes or logicals are 726 gig. So two-thirds of the space is taken up by the indices. Um, just so that if you're looking at the physical size, you, you, know, you realize it's not absolutely everything. So this was an opportunity-rich environment, not only from a transactional side, but also from a custom side, but also from a how are you approaching things from a business side. You know, 50,000 assets, but 3 million asset balance records. So processes around how they use the chart of accounts, posting to the 902, detail summary, posting information, the amount of history that they actually need to hang on to for payroll. So, so here's the, the, the small sales pitch. And pardon me, I'm an accountant, I'm not a salesperson, but what we offer to help with this is purging. So it's purpose-built within J.D. Edwards. So if you, know, if you see it, you're running this in J.D. Edwards. It's menus, it's favorites, it's QBE, it's customizable grids, it's J.D. Edwards. So uh, main transactional systems, GL, receivables, payables, purchasing sales, inventory, work orders, payroll, out of the box stock. It's designed for referential integrity. So it's got the guardrails that are hard coded to keep you out of trouble. You can't remove a GL transaction if it's not posted. You cannot remove a purchase order unless it's at a final status code. You cannot remove a purchase order if it's got outstanding receipts or it's not fully received. There's also options in there. Um, do you use RMAs? Do you maintain the as of integrity file or the as of file? In inventory. So there are switches. They're basically processing options that let you determine what else you want to make sure you want to check. On the GL side, you want to validate against receivables, payables, purchasing sales. Check there to make sure the related transactions have already been cleared. It runs as a module in JD Edwards. It runs in proof mode and final mode. So you can run it first and say, what would happen if I do this? And see the results, and then you can run it in final mode. And yeah, it's got an undo button. So the undo lets you undo for some modules at the transactional level. So if you say this individual purchase order, I want to pull back, this individual batch in accounts bill, cool, you can do that. So there are batch jobs, data selection, processing options, just like you're used to in J.D. Edwards. It's got a full audit trail, so everything that it does, it keeps track of, full details for exceptions. So if I did, was not able to remove these 20,000 purchase orders or these 30,000 GL records, why? Well, it's because the date was after the cutoff or it's related to a purchase order that could not be removed because it's still open and you said to check related orders. Or it's not posted or it's tied to a job that's still open. So you'll know what it is. You will also get a dashboard to look at your production versus your archive by module down to the table level and see what's there. The custom module lets you literally take care of anything else. I'm, I'm in the midst of two projects right now, like I mentioned, where we are removing uh, master data and transactional data 
including custom tables, including chart of accounts, including item master, including branch plants, including kind of whatever, and F55 to F59 information. So it's got referential joins, so I can remove records from my 55, 42, 119, only if my 4201 record's already been cleared out. So I can do that. I can do in, not in, like, not like, between, not between for ranges, equal to and other logical comparisons in there. So it's a really sophisticated solution to let you get at anything that we do not have a standard module for. So any other questions? Um, at this point, Alana. Yeah, we're just coming up to the end here soon. Um, and this question, I feel like we could probably do a whole separate presentation on it, possibly. Uh -huh. uh, but it's, do you have any tips for convincing upper management or users that this kind of project needs to happen? <laughs> Age old question. Yeah, it's funny. Yeah. <laughs> um, we get this all the time, and it's probably the number one thing that keeps Project like projects like this from moving. Um, there's a there's a bit of motherhood that says, like you need to do it. Um, the general rule of thumb, if you have more than seven, years, certainly when you get to ten years of data, you just got too much there. You need to clean it out. If you've got a divestiture, if you've done um, the closed lines of business, you should be doing it just to keep things clean, to keep mistakes from happening without within there. So. From a, from a pure archive perspective, what I would do is I would take a look at, you know, again, the starting point is the data analysis. What have you got out there? What can you clear up? Can you translate that into dollar savings for the business? So if we do this properly, we're able to clear off two and a half terabytes of space per environment. Uh, that means our disk space can come down. Uh, that means that our server load's going to come down. That means, you know, let's bench, we can benchmark some of our long running processes. Um, take a look at things. If you're running 24 7 these days or close to, are you getting close to the window for your backups? How much are you paying for hosting? So, what's the metrics that are important to your stakeholders and figure out what you can provide them with that will give them some wins on that. I will say as well that we often hear people say, I'd like to do it, but our business users just don't want to get rid of their data. Honest to God, that's a red herring. Um, so often I've encountered situations where we've gone through and done the archive and I go back a year later and say, so, we kept more information that's there. We provided an option for them to get to their archive data. How much did they use it? And the answer is we had two users go in once each in the last year. So overall, um, you need to maintain your system. You need to keep your data tables clean to keep performance going, to keep to have from having issues to keep legal liability, because if you got a data, you might need to present it, um, and to just keep things humming. Okay. So, and there are some cost savings for systems, disk, hosted environments. Okay. And then um, another question that's come in is, do customers use Purgit to keep the test environment small? Oh, well, yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, so a couple of things on that. One, if your test environment you're using, you're creating your ripple dippling, technically speaking, down from production to your test or to PY or to DD. Yeah, the smaller you've got production, the smaller it is that your training environment would be. You could also, if you wanted to, just use purge it to winnow down the, to so run purge it uh, just on the training or you know, whichever environment you want and kind of keep that clean. The other thing that, uh, not related to this, but there's a, there's a subscription product we have called Manage It, and Manage It has an actual component in it that is specifically for setting up test environments. So that allows you to say, I want to take information from production, build um, 
pre-built scripts and criteria to say, take information down. I want to do some GL testing. A GL testing does not need all of my sales, lease accounting, uh, payroll purchasing information. So I'm going to copy down selectively from my tables. I'll take a bit of time, invest that in the script. And then when I want to recreate my GL testing scenario, I just run that script and it creates it for me. So a couple of options there. I hope that helps. Yes, and if there's any further clarification, uh, please send that to me. Uh, but I think that's uh, that's it for right now, Mike. We are good to carry on. Okay, cool. So what I'd hope out of this is if you think that you might have some issues or you're just kind of interested in knowing where things stand, reach out. Let me do a complimentary data analysis for you. I mean, literally, um, if I'm not too, if there's not too much going on, the stuff can usually be turned around within a day or two. So, if you've got any questions or you're thinking, yeah, we want to be able to handle this, how can we do it? Let me know. Reach out to me. I'm a consultant at heart um, and a business person second, and I want to be able to help you out. So, uh, let me know how I can do that for you. So just a, a little bit here as well. So we're talking about ISP3. So uh, we've been around for quite a while, uh, over 20 years of experience. Um, we have a number of people, you know, I'm looking at the, the faces in here. Uh, a bunch of them I recommend, I recognize from back in the 90s when I was at JD Edwards and a number of these people were there as well. So these are very experienced people on the JDM side. That's our team. Across all the JDM's core applications, um, industry experience for best practices, very specialized knowledge in payroll and uh, plant and equipment and uh, mining in that. Really close knit, um, a tight group. We're also JDM's customers. So, you know, we're talking about um, OCI and all that. We run JD Edwards in the cloud, nine two. So not only do we consult on JD Edwards, we're also it's like the hair club for men, right? We're also JD Edwards customers. So, and uh, just a, a little friendly note up on the top right there, the uh, the awesome assistant we have here today, that's Alana up at the top, and that's her awesome assistant helping her out on a daily basis too. Yes. So it's the, this uh, the chief meow kidding officer. <laughs> <laughs> meow kidding. That's great. And uh, this uh, this funky looking guy here. Oh, it's great. Yeah, do it as a do it as a line. I'm putting it across through my own face. How's that, huh? This guy here, with the I love JD Edwards on his laptop. That's me in my home office. So thumbs up and thanks for your time today. Uh, we'll keep this open for another minute or two, Alana, to see if there's any other questions. So other than that, um, thank you, everybody. I hope this is helpful for you, and um, look forward to hearing back from you if there's things we can do. If you're watching this recorded afterwards, check out the contact information uh, and reach out to us as well. So thanks, all.